is manifesting a new age teaching. Can Christians manifest? In this lecture, I'm going to be seeking to answer that question. Now I want to begin by defining a few terms, two to be exact. The first term I want to define is manifesting. What does it mean to manifest as it were? Manifesting, according to most definitions, is simply willing something into existence, typically by words, thoughts, and or actions. And so to manifest means to will something into existence, typically by words, thoughts, and or actions. So it can be one of the three or two of the three or all three. And so it's simply willing something or some would say believing something into existence. And so you have a reality which does not exist in your context. And by some mechanism or another, you will that into existence, such as a relationship or a job or an object or whatever else the case may be. You're willing something into existence. And so the question is, is manifesting the practice, the doctrine biblical? What that question essentially means is when we study the scripture, do we find that practice, that doctrine, that concept, that idea in the scriptures, the idea of willing things or believing things into existence? Uh, the answer is it depends on how you define manifest. It depends on how you define manifest. The answer of is manifesting biblical depends on your definition of manifest. Uh, the definition that I'm using is simply to will and or believe something into existence by words, actions, and or thoughts. Again, to manifest is to will or to believe something into existence by words, actions, and or thoughts. And so according to my definition, manifesting the concept is a biblical concept. We do in the scriptures have a concept of believing things into existence or willing things into existence by words, thoughts, and or actions. Uh, and so the first claim I want to make very emphatically is that manifesting in and of itself as a concept, as the uh, according to the definition that I'm using, manifesting is not immoral. That means it's not morally wrong. It doesn't break any of God's moral laws because some people make claims of manifesting as witchcraft and all these sorts of things. And again, it depends on how you're conceptualizing manifesting and how you're defining manifesting. But I'm, I'm speaking in accordance to the definition that I'm using, which has basis because most of the uh, if not all the sources that I consulted concerning the definition of manifest all have a similar idea is simply willing something into existence is, is causing something to be in the natural world that did not have its presence in the natural world, whether it's a uh, relationship, a thing, an opportunity, a situation, a circumstance, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so first the claim, the first claim I want to make uh, in attempting to answer this question is manifesting is not immoral. Uh, and the premise for that is that because God himself, quote unquote, manifests. Again, what does that mean? It means God wills things into existence. Romans chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. That is God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that do not exist, which is a concept of manifesting is causing things to exist by your words. Remember the definition was, the definition of manifest is to will something into, or to will or to believe something into existence by words, actions, or thoughts. And so in this instance, the Bible says that God calls things into being that did not exist. And so say that this Bible did not exist, God can call it into being, right? In Genesis chapter one, he said light be. He's calling light into being by his words, that is manifesting. He's causing something to exist by his words. Hebrews chapter 11, verse three, by faith we understand that the world has been created by the word of God, so that, that what so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are visible. And so God created things by his words. Now, if God does something, it cannot be immoral. If God does something, that thing cannot be immoral. Why? Because God is subject to his own moral laws. See, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, the Bible says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and just as he. And the Hebrew there, word there for righteous is sedek. It means law abiding. That means God abides by his own laws. God is righteous. If God sets a law, he abides by his own rules. 
So God will never say don't lie, and then he himself lies. Because God's commands come from his nature. The reason why God says to not lie is because God doesn't lie. The reason why God says don't steal is because God doesn't steal. The reason why God says don't murder is because God doesn't murder. The reason why God says and so forth and so on, right? And so whatever God is, is what he wants man to be because he created man in his image and likeness. He wants man to be a replica of himself, to be a copy and paste of himself. So whatever God is, he wants man to be. So if God doesn't lie, that is his nature, he'll speak forth from his nature and say, man, don't lie. So that man's character, man's deportment will be made conformable to God's deportment, God's character. And so God instructs from his nature. And so here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the righteous. And so he's telling you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because God loves everyone. So Jesus is saying, love everyone irrespective of their behavior. Because God loves everyone irrespective of their behavior. So he says, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the righteous. In other words, he loves people irrespective of how they behave. Therefore, you ought to love people irrespective of how they behave. So Jesus then says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So there's God's nature and then God's instructions come from his nature. And so God cannot do something that is immoral or wrong. And so if God manifests, manifesting can't be wrong. People think manifesting is wrong because new age practitioners practice manifestation. The issue with that is that you cannot make an argument, or well, you can, but it is a foolish argument to say if a new age practitioner promulgates doctrine X, doctrine X is automatically unbiblical. In other words, what people are doing is that they're seeing new age people teach certain things and assuming that what they're teaching is false because a person who is not a Christian is teaching it. So it's essentially like saying that if a non-Christian teaches something, what they're teaching is automatically wrong. It's automatically unbiblical. It's not as if an unbeliever can't pick up the Bible and find a doctrine and teach it. Just because somebody who is not a Christian teaches something does not mean it's automatically wrong. What you have to do is to take whatever they're teaching and juxtapose it to scripture. Don't just assume that because they're new age, it must automatically, not necessarily. There are actually many truths that new age practitioners promulgate that are similar to biblical doctrines and are even biblical doctrines like the idea of faith they may not say the word faith or they might have different terminologies for these concepts but a lot of the just like in, just like islam for instance there are many things and teachings that they have that are consistent with scripture you don't just say oh he's muslim so he's wrong what if a muslim says you shouldn't lie Can, should i say that no 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 it's, it's, it's false no 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 you shouldn't lie many of the moral laws or some of the moral laws are congruent with the bible's moral laws I don't assume that because somebody who's outside of the faith says something, it's automatically wrong. As if only Christians can be correct. That's not true. You see that now. And so manifesting is not immoral because God manifests. And if God does something, it can't be immoral because God can't break his own moral laws. Okay, that's first. Secondly, Christians are allowed to manifest. Why? Because Jesus himself manifested. And we are commanded to imitate Jesus' earthly life. And I'll give witness to that later, but... First, I want to go to Matthew 17, 24 to 27. Uh, he says, Now when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher, referring to Jesus, not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Yes. And when they came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From who do the, the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, Excuse me, then the sons are exempt. 27, however, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw it in a hook or throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a stator. Take that and give it to them for you and me. So to give context, Jesus and Peter needed to pay their taxes. Jesus did not have money on him at the moment and so he made money come out of a fish's mouth. He manifested money. That's what he literally did. So the money was not in his physical possession. Yet in that moment, they needed money to pay the taxes or Jesus needed money to pay taxes for himself, for Peter. 
And what Jesus did was he made Peter go get a coin out of a fish's mouth. Obviously, it was supernatural, but he manifested the coin, right? I know that that's not a term that we, we don't use that term in scripture, but I'm talking about the concept of manifesting. He willed something into existence. The coin wasn't there before. When he spoke what he spoke, then the coin was found in the fish's mouth. And so he willed that coin into the fish's mouth. He manifested the coin. And in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14 and 20 to 21, the Bible says, On the next day when they had left Bethany, he became hungry, speaking to Jesus, speaking about Jesus. Seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Verse 20. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree wither from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And so here, Jesus went to a fig tree. It had no fruit on it. And so he got angry and cursed the fig tree. And the fig tree withered up from its roots. And, well, it didn't happen immediately. So a few days later, the disciples were walking with Jesus. And they saw that the fig tree that Jesus cursed had actually withered as Jesus spoke. And so he manifested a reality here. He spoke something into existence. When he first went up to the fig tree, again, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. And then he said, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. Right? So he made a command. He commanded the fig tree and said, this fig tree will never produce fruit for anybody again. And then when they came back and saw that fig tree, it was withered up. Obviously meaning that no one could ever eat fruit from again. It's a dead fig tree, right? And so he manifested that possibility. He caused something to be. He created a possibility. He created a reality of a withered fig tree. The fig tree wasn't withered before. He spoke and made the fig tree wither by his word, by faith. And so that's manifesting. That's the idea of manifesting is willing something into existence by words, thoughts, and actions. And in this case, he's by his words. Now, why is this relevant? Well, because we are commanded to imitate Jesus' earthly life. I call it the law of Christomimicry. It means it is the principle that Christians are commanded to imitate Jesus' earthly life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible says, The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also to walk just as he, referring to Jesus, walked. We're supposed to live as Jesus lived even in his earthly life. And in John 13, when Jesus washed Peter's feet, he told him that I'm doing this as an example. If you call me Lord and call me teacher, if I wash your feet, then you ought to wash each other's feet. Why? Because of me being your master, I'm your example, I'm your pattern. If I do X, then you should do X. If I do Y, you should do Y. So first, I first established that manifestation or manifesting is not immoral because God manifests and God cannot do something immoral because he cannot break his moral laws. And here I'm showing you that Christians are... Um, or that I'm, here, here I'm showing you that Jesus actually himself practiced manifesting, quote unquote, in his earthly life. And that's relevant because we are commanded to imitate Jesus's earthly life. And so Jesus manifested in his earthly life. We're commanded to imitate Jesus's earthly life, which means Christians also should practice manifesting. What does that, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that a part of the Christian life is us having the power to wheel things into existence. The only caveat is that it's under the canopy of the will of God. That's the only difference. It's not just whatever I desire, I manifest. Not necessarily. Because the Bible says, or Jesus said that he doesn't do anything that he hasn't seen the Father do. He's not just a free being walking around manifesting. Oh, no, 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 no. He's doing everything he's doing under the canopy of God's will. So here is God's will. And here is Jesus. He's acting under the cloud of God's will. He's not functioning fully autonomous. Uh, autonomously to the point where he's doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. No, he's not self-governed. He's governed by God. But he still manifested things in his life. The coin, the fig tree. This is a part of his life. He was powerful enough to be able to cause things to come into existence. Why? Because he's a son of God. And I know what people will think, yeah, but that's Jesus. That's not us. That's exactly the problem. Remember, Jesus said, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than he shall he do. Uh, Christians are supposed to manifest the possibility that Jesus manifested on earth. That's why we're called Christians, Christ followers, not just following his morality. I think we've compartmentalized Christ and we're selecting which aspects of his life we're supposed to copy. So we just think 
living like Jesus is just morality, just being a good person. But all the supernatural stuff, oh, leave that for God. But let's just, no, no, no. He said, the works that I do, not just the moral works, all the works, the supernatural works, including here manifesting, which is causing things to come into existence, which he did here. He caused a coin to come into existence. He withered a fig tree by his word. Thirdly, Jesus told the apostles that they could manifest operating the same law. And I'm using manifest here in quotations because I know the word manifest in the way in which we're using it is not in the scripture, but the concept is in the scripture. In the same way the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept of God being three persons in the Bible, the word manifest in the way in which we're using it is not in the Bible. Of course, manifest in the English translations, you'll find it, you know, the manifestation of the spirit and so forth. That's a different context. Manifest in the context in which we're speaking of manifest is not found in the scripture, the word anyway. But the concept of manifesting is in the Bible. The idea of bringing or causing things to come into existence, willing or believing things into existence is found in scripture. And I showed you in Romans 4 and in Hebrews 11, God willed the world into existence. And Jesus here willed a coin into existence. He willed a fig tree to wither by his word. Uh, and thirdly, I'm here going to show you that Jesus actually told the apostles that they could and are supposed to manifest, operating the same law that he operated in causing the fig tree to wither here he says in matthew chapter 21 verses 18 to 22 and this is another account of jesus causing the fig tree to wither he says now in the early morning when he was returning to the city referring to jesus he jesus became hungry and seeing a lone fig tree by the road he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves alone and he said to it no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you and at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? So in this account, the fig tree withered immediately and the disciples saw the fig tree wither right before their eyes. And now they're asking Jesus, how did you do this? So get the context. Jesus does a supernatural work. He manifests the reality, he causes the fig tree to wither by his word. And now the apostles are asking, how did you do that? This is his answer. And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree. So he's saying, if you have faith, the same way I have faith, not only will we be able to do what I just did, which is causing a fig tree to wither by a word, but he says, but even if you say to this mountain, so I'm sure you pointed to a mountain, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And then he says, and whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive it all now this is how mark says it in mark 11 chapter 23 truly i say to you whoever says to this mountain be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt so he adds a bit more and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says is going to happen it will be granted to him therefore i say to you all things for which you ask for which you pray and ask believe you will receive them and it will be granted to you. So what he's saying here is that the same way I spoke and caused the fig tree to wither, you also have the same power by faith to speak things into existence. You can even speak to a mountain and cause it to be displaced. Again, he said, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. So what he's saying here is that if your words are full of faith, you can cause things to obey your words. That is manifesting. So I can speak things into existence as God speaks things into existence. Now, what people might think is that this is some sort of human deification. That, oh, this is trying to make man God. We're not trying to be God, be most high God, but we are gods in the sense that we are rulers who rule on the behalf of God and we are the image and likeness of God and we can do as God does in our limited capacity. So just as God is creative, he's given us the ability to create power of life, which is the ability to create, and death, which is the ability to destroy, is in the tongue. So with your tongue, you can create and you can destroy. And that's given to all men, not to, when I say men, I'm, not, I'm talking gender agnostic, not males, but humans. All men are given the ability to create and destroy with the words, right? Um, And this is why new age and people who are not Christians are actually able to manifest because that it's a resident power. It's a power given to all human beings to create and destroy with the words. The Bible says a man's belly shall be filled with the fruit of your mouth. 
That means your words are seeds and what you sow you reap. And so your world will look like your words. That's not a new age teaching, it's truth. Just because new age people teach it does not mean it's not true. So people have that idea that because if a new age person says it, it must not be true. So then if a Christian says something that sounds similar, oh, they're teaching new age. So if I come and say, um, you can speak things into existence, oh, he's teaching new age, but I can show you scripture where he literally says, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. Oh, he's teaching new age, but God does it. So is God also new age? Because God also speaks things into existence. Whatever, whatever claim you're going to make about me, you must also make about him because I'm just copying my father. How can I be wrong in doing something that God does? That doesn't, I actually makes no sense because he's the moral standard. If I'm wrong, then he must also be wrong. So you know that that's God. Well, what do you mean that's the God? I, like I showed you before, God is subject to his own moral laws. You can't say he's wrong for me, but it's not wrong for him. As I saying, God lied, but it's okay for God to lie because he's God. No, 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 if it's wrong, it's wrong. The Bible says God is a righteous God, it means he's subject to his own laws. If he says it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to lie. He's not above the law, even God. If manifesting is immoral, then God wouldn't do it. But if manifesting is not immoral, then, excuse me, but if God manifests, then manifesting cannot be immoral. The only issue is that, which I'll get into later on, is that the, the practice of manifesting is not the issue. It is the principles by which you manifest that separate the Christian from the New Age practitioner. That's the difference. Just like meditation. The concept of meditating is not the issue. But there are a few principles that differentiate Eastern meditation from Biblical meditation. But it's just those few principles that make the difference. Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't take much error for you to go astray. It can be one little small difference, one little principle that changes the entire practice from giving you access and interaction with the Holy Spirit and making you or or making you susceptible and open to another spirit. It can be one little difference, one little practice, and one little principle or belief that can change it all. So the concept of manifesting is not ungodly or un, or it's it's unbiblical or it's witchcraft. No, no, no. It's not manifesting that's the problem. The idea of speaking things into existence is not unbiblical. It's perfectly biblical. But there are just a few principles that separate biblical manifesting, quote unquote, from new age manifesting, quote unquote. The same thing with meditation, the same thing with prayer. There are other faiths that pray. Are they praying how we pray? No, but are they praying? Yes. They're doing the thing, but it's how they're doing the thing. All the religions pray, but they're not praying by the principles by which we're praying. They don't say in Jesus' name. They're not praying in Jesus' name. <laughs> Do you understand? It's the same thing with manifesting. It is a biblical principle, but how other people who are outside the faith apply the practice of manifesting is a bit different because they apply some principles that we don't apply and we apply some principles that they don't apply. So it's, there's a differentiation in principles or I should say the methodology. So we're doing the same thing we're manifesting, but by different methods, that's what separates us. A Muslim and a Christian are both praying, but by different methods and they're praying to a different being, see? But the thing they're doing is the same, prayer, prayer, but it's how they're praying that's different, who they're praying to, the methods they're using to pray, the principles they're using to pray, and all of these different things, right? So manifesting, the Christian and the New Age person both manifest, but the methodology is what separates the two of them. It's how they're doing it. It's not what they're doing. We think it's manifesting that's the that's not the problem. It's how they're doing it that's the problem. And I'll get into that a bit later. Now, here we even have examples of men in the Old Testament who quote-unquote manifested or spoke things or caused things or willed things into existence. Joshua here, in the book of Joshua chapter 10, verses 10 to 12, he says, And the Lord brought them into confusion before Israel, and he struck them down in a great defeat at Gibeon, and pursued them by the way of the ascent to Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Mechadah. And they fled from Israel while they were at the descent of Beth Horon. The Lord hurled large stones from heaven on them, As far as Azekah, they died. They were there were more who died from the hailstones than those who the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Now, verse twelve years old. I want you to pay attention to. He said, "Then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day that on the day when the Lord turned. Sorry, the text is really small. That's why I'm struggling to read it. Let me make it bigger. Yeah, that's better." He said, then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day when the Lord turned the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon at the valley of Ajalon. And so here Joshua literally commanded the sun and moon to stop. Now, if you study biblical cosmology, God has commanded the sun to make circuit around the earth. 
right? And what Joshua did is that he spoke to the sun and made the sun stand still at a particular spot. And the moon also in its circuit, he spoke to the moon and moon, made the moon stand still at its spot. See, now, this is a human being who is commanding celestial bodies and the celestial bodies are obeying him. I'm not talking about manifesting a job. He's speaking to the sun and the moon and the sun and moon is in your Bible. And the sun and moon are obeying him. He just willed something into existence by his word. So the sun is moving and then he speaks and gets the sun to stop moving. And so now his words are carrying enough power to manifest a possibility that was not uh, uh, or I should say he commanded a possibility that didn't exist beforehand before the sun is moving and now the sun isn't moving by his word he manifested that possibility here you have another example of prophet Elisha in 2 Kings 4 13 and 17 and he said to him say now to her behold you have taken trouble for us with all this care what can I do for you would you like me to speak for you to the king or to the commander of the army? So this woman is showing great hospitality and Elisha wants to thank her and appreciate her and honor her for all the hospitality. But she answered, I live among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi, which is his servant, uh, today we'll call it his personal assistant. And Gehazi answered, it is a fact that she has no son and her husband is old. He then said, call her. When he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, at this season, this is Elisha speaking, a prophet. At this season next year, you are going to embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, you man of God, which means a man sent from God, do not lie to your servant. Now the woman conceived and gave birth to a son at, the, at that season the next year, as Elisha told her. And so here Elisha manifested a literal human being. He spoke a human being into existence. God didn't tell him to say this. He said it by his own impetus, but God backed it because God was in agreement with what Elisha was doing. It's manifesting. And it's not, there's nothing complicated about this. I'm just trying to show you that manifesting is a biblical concept. There are all kinds of examples like this in the Bible where people spoke things into existence. A guy made the sun stop. A guy made a baby. A guy uh, uh, manifested a human being into existence. <laughs> then Jesus causes a fig tree to wither. He manifests a coin out of a fish's mouth, which is what people call miracle money, which is obviously a biblical concept because that was miracle money. is money coming miraculously. Um... And then you have various scriptures about manifesting. Luke chapter 17, verse 6. But the Lord said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. You have another scripture that says, um, in the book of Joel, you shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. You will say something, and the thing you said will happen. Another scripture that says a man's belly, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20, with the fruit of a person's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Another version here says, well, in the King James. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips, he shall be filled. Right? And so his words are seeds and his words will produce results in the natural realm. His belly shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. So what he's speaking will come back to him. Right? A new age might call it what? Karma. They might have these different terms for it. So let's take the example of karma. You do bad things, bad things happen to you. I can show you a scripture for it. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 8, he says, He who sows iniquity will reap vanity. And then... Um, And then Proverbs eleven eighteen says, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. So what that simply means is if you do bad things, bad things will happen. If you do good things, good things will happen. Isn't that what they call karma? But isn't it a biblical, is it a biblical concept? Yes, your actions have repercussions. It's a biblical concept. They might have a different terminology for it. But if I come and say, 
But if I come on a, if someone goes on a pulpit and says, uh, you have bad karma, so there's new age. All they're saying is that you've been making bad decisions that are not coming back to you. Don't get too hung up on words. It's more, what's more important is the concept that they're trying to convey with word. What people do is that they hear words that new age people use, and then they think that because you're using a word they use, you're trying to push people towards submitting themselves to doctrines of the new age. When all you're doing is using that word because it's what people are familiar with. If I say karma, people know what I'm referring to. I can say the law of reciprocity. What you sow will be what you, I can call the law of seed time and harvest. There are all these different terms for it. It's still referring to the same concept. Your actions have repercussions. Newton is the third law of motion. You know, each action has its equal and opposite reaction, right? Actions have their consequences. Seed have their harvest. It's the same principle, just different terminologies. Don't get hung up on terms. What you should be focused on is concepts. Is the concept biblical, not is the word in the Bible. That's what people do with the Trinity. Oh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I'm not arguing for the Trinity, the word Trinity being in the Bible. That's a straw man argument. I'm not arguing to say, I can show you where the Bible says, no, no, no. My argument is for the concept of God being three persons. So you're not refuting my argument by saying, well, show me where the Bible says the word Trinity. Because I didn't claim that the Bible did say Trinity. What I'm claiming is that God is three persons. It is a concept that can be displayed in scripture. See? So when we're discussing these concepts, forget about the terms we're using. Try to understand the concept. So when somebody says karma, ask them, what do you mean by karma? When somebody says manifest, ask them, what do you mean by manifest? Don't just assume based on what you think they mean by the word they're using. Ask them what they mean by the word they're using. Because if a preacher comes and says, Christian, I'm going to teach Christians how to manifest. People have assumptions. Oh, he's teaching them new age doctrines. But all he could be saying is I'm teaching Christians how to speak in accordance with God's word and manifest realities that God wants them to manifest. Let's give a very, a very specific scenario here. And this is where we'll end. And this scenario is going to differentiate biblical, let's call it biblical manifesting and new age manifesting. You say two people want a dream job, a job that they've always wanted, that has the income they want, the perks they want, packet, uh, the, 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 um, the benefits they want, they get to work with people they want to work with, in the office they want to work in, so forth, dream job. Now, say Ryan, who is into new age, is betwixt job A and job B, two options here. Both of them, Ryan and John, Ryan is a new age practitioner, and John is a Christian. Ryan has two options, job A and job B. Ryan wants job A. So if Ryan is in the new age, what Ryan will do is that he'll define his desire. What does he want? He wants job A. And then through some methodology, he'll manifest that desire, you see? And then he'll get the job that he's looking for if he actually knows what he's doing. So the new age person will decide what it is they want and then find out how to manifest what they want and then manifest it. Simple as that. Now, John the Christian is also in the same predicament. He's betwixt two jobs. He's in between two jobs, job A and job B. Now, he wants job A. Uh, but because of how important your trade is, he's not going to make this decision without consulting God. Because there are three factors to consider when trying to ascertain whether or not you're in the will of God. Being in the will of God is three things. Is what you are doing, which is your assignment, where you are, which is your location, and who you are with, or who you are doing what you're supposed to be doing with, which is your associations. When I say I'm in the perfect will of God, it means I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, where I'm supposed to be doing it, with the people I'm supposed to be doing it with. That's alignment with God's will. So anytime you follow people's walks with God, there's always specificities as to where God wants them to be. I mean, the region, right? Jesus says, I was not sent I was sent only to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel, or the lost tribes of Israel. He knows the physical location he's supposed to be at. Abraham was sent to a physical location. Get out of your father's country and go to this land that I promised to your descendants, right? So it's, God is, um, your location is very important because your location connects you to the necessary associations, right? So your job can affect your associations, the people that you're around. It can affect your assignment, the things that you're spending your time doing, and it can affect your um, sorry, it's assignment, location, and association. Your job can affect your assignment, that is these the things you're doing. It can affect your location, where you are. You know, a job can cause you to commute, 
and your uh, uh, your job can affect your associations who you with. So a job is very important, and so that's why uh, John is not going to make that decision without consulting God. And so Ryan would just define what he wants, find out how to manifest his desire, and then get what he wants. John first. He may define his desire. He wants of the two options between job A and job B. He may want job A, but because he's a mature believer, he's going to inquire of God, just as David would inquire of God before going to war. A normal soldier would just go into war, make a strategy and try to win. David would first relax himself, inquire of God and ask God, should I go to this war? Sometimes God would say yes, and sometimes God would say no. And so John is going to ask God, I have two options here, job A and job B. Which one is your will? And John wants job A. Now, sometimes God will actually say, no, I want you to take job B. But let's say in this instance, God actually also wants John to have job A. Now, so John defines his desire. He inquires of God. Then he ascertains God's will. And then now here's, that's the first major difference is that the new age person doesn't consider the divine will. They just define what they want and manifest what they want. The Christian may have in their heart what they want, but if they're mature, they won't run off their desire. They'll first make sure that that desire that they have is what God wants them to have. That's the first big difference. So Ryan says, I want X. This is how I get X. I get X. John says, I want X. Let me find out if God wants me to want X or wants me to have X. The answer is yes. Okay, now they're both at the same point. Ryan wants X. John wants X. Where they differ is... Ryan doesn't consider what God wants because he's not in a covenantal relationship with God. John considers what God wants. And if John, God confirms that what he wants is what God wants, now he'll then pursue it. Now, here's another differentiation. Uh, many times the differentiation can also be in the method because there are also new age uh, methods of manifestation that are plainly immoral. For instance, somebody may try to... Um, manifest a possibility through immoral sex right there's such a concept as that in the new age where through many obscene sexual practices people will manifest and this is actually ancient it's even in the scripture very ancient even uh uh, uh pagan homosexual worship these were actually methods of worship to appease god so they can manifest certain possibilities so many methods that new age people apply in trying to manifest things may just be plainly immoral but then sometimes it's not. Sometimes somebody may just simply say, I want a dream job, so I'll write down the job 300 times. I'll write down the name of the job 300 times. That's also that kind of method. Um, um, so the methodology, so the first place we differ is that, is the consideration of God's will. The second place we differ sometimes is the methodology, the morality of the methodology, right? Um, and then the third place we differ is where our faith is. The new age person's faith is in the method. The Christian's faith is in God. And the new age person's faith is in the fact that they're writing down that dream job a hundred times. They think that action is what gets the result. The Christian's faith is in God to bring the result. Because in Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, he says, I planted a Paulus water, but God causes the growth. God is always the one that delivers the result. You do the work. You plant the seed. You sow the water. But you're not responsible for the thing growing. You can't make the plant grow. You just create the conditions and the environment for the plant to grow. But the plant actually growing is outside of your jurisdiction. You see that now. You feed the baby, you nurture them, but they're actually growing, the baby actually growing, I can't make them grow. I can just cultivate the environment for them to grow. That's how it works. So I can abide by the principle, but God actually delivers the result. My faith is in him to deliver the result. The Bible says, I planted, Apollos watered what I planted, but it's God that causes the growth. So our faith is in God to deliver the result. The new age person's faith is in the method. They think it's the thing they're doing that brings the result. And so they're actually idolizing the method. And then once they receive their result, they as the person get the glory because they can say, I got this result because I did X, Y, and Z. But the Christian, if they manifest a possibility in alignment with God's will, they will come to testify before God's people that is because of God's goodness or whatever the case may be, however they want to articulate it, because they know that the result was delivered by God. Now, also, I want to also mention that when you abide by spiritual laws, God is supposed to be the one that actualizes the possibility. He's the one that delivers the result. He's supposed to be the one that delivers the result. But you see uh, in, uh, how it works spiritually is that whenever you don't allow God to do something that he's supposed to do, another spirit will come to replace him in doing that thing. 
The thing is that whatever law you obey in the natural, some spirit being has to actualize it because the spiritual realm is the mother realm of the natural realm. That request that you make in the natural, some spiritual being has to make it happen in the spiritual before it can manifest in the natural. It's supposed to be God. The same way, Jesus, God is supposed to be the one that lifts men, that exalts men. The Bible says promotion comes neither from the east nor the west, but it comes from God, right? Now, Jesus here is about to be promoted and exalted as a Christ, but Satan wants to fast track that method and say, forget all that thing with God. Bow to me now and I'll give you all the kingdoms and the glories of the world. So Satan wants to promote Jesus, but Jesus obviously knows that it's a fluke. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that Satan can find out what it is that you're looking for from God and seek to give you that result artificially. So I'm saying all that to say that other spirits can do for you what God should be the one doing for you. Or excuse me, other spirits can do for you what only God should do for you. So that they can make God obsolete in your life. This is why new age people like uh, are so adamantly against religion and are so in favor of things like tarot card reading, you see. So the thing is that new age practitioners, they're against religion, but they still want the results that you're supposed to get from God. So for instance, Somebody goes to a tarot card reader because they want to access cryptic information. They want to know things that the natural man cannot ascertain. So they go to a tarot card reader. Whereas a Christian would maybe either consult the Holy Spirit personally or they go to a prophet. But they're still looking for the same thing. You're still looking for hidden information. The only difference is the new age person doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't have, they don't have to acknowledge God as the one that's giving them the result because they're not going to God. They're going to another spirit to get the result they're looking for from God. Just like how people bootleg things. They don't want to get the real thing, so they'll go outsource the thing from a fake outlet. You see? So here, somebody wants hidden information. God is supposed to be the revealer of mysteries for men, but men don't want to worship him. So instead of going to God, other spirits will be able to market and sell that same product without having to go to God. So other spirits will say, I know you're in a state of rebellion. Our master caused you to be this way. So you don't want to have to acknowledge God, but you're still looking for that product. You're still looking for that hidden information. So I'll create systems in the cosmos by which you can access hidden information and not have to consult God. So there are other methods of getting results. Even when it comes to miracles, it's not only God that can heal the sick. The Bible tells you of false prophets who will do lying wonders. Fake miracles. A fake miracle is not a miracle that didn't happen. A fake miracle is a miracle that happened by a different spirit. The same way that somebody can prophesy by the spirit of divination. That information can be 100% accurate. The problem is not the accuracy. The problem is the spirit from whence it came. There was a woman with the spirit of divination in the book of Acts. She said, these men show us the way of salvation. It was 100% accurate, but it wasn't by the Holy Spirit. Truth is not something that corresponds to reality. Truth is the word of God. That means if God didn't say it, and the person in that spirit is posing as God, is not true. Even though it may be factual, there's a difference. It may be accurate information, but according to the definition, the biblical definition of truth, is not truth, because truth is the word of God. That means if that spirit speaks, and what they're speaking is not what God has spoken, it's not true, even though it may be factually accurate. The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? You're supposed to prophesy according to what God has spoken. That's what makes it truth, is what God is saying. If another spirit is saying it, it may be factually accurate, but it's not truth. It's not the word of God, you see. I'm just saying that there are other methods of getting results that we're only supposed to get from God. And so that's why these new age folks are so against religion. But they still want the results that God gives. So they outsource different spiritual methods to get these results. And so when it comes particularly to manifesting, it's actually supposed to be that even if I speak something, it's God that's supposed to make it happen. So if I, for example, when Jesus caused the fig tree to wither, it's God that actually caused it to happen. Because the Bible says, who is he that speaks a thing and it comes to pass except the Lord commands it? That means if you speak something, it's supposed to be God that actualizes what you speak. But if somebody wants to manifest that reality and have power to speak things into existence, but not have to acknowledge God, another spirit will come and be the one that makes that word come to pass. The same way God is supposed to be the lifter of men, but Satan wanted to come to replace God and say, forget about God, Jesus, let me be the one to exalt you. You just bow to me. So other spirits seek to come and take God's place in our lives. These are what we call idols. 
they want to replace God because they don't want you to worship him. They don't necessarily want you to worship them per se. They just don't want you to worship him. Whatever else you want to worship is up to you. That's your own business. But just don't worship him. It's an anti-government. That's why they call it the anti-Christ. They're not necessarily seeking for you to worship them per se. They just want you to not worship God. See? And so they want you to be able to get results that only God can give, but not have to go to God. So you can still get something like prophecy. You can still get something like healing, something like miracles, but you don't have to go to the Holy Spirit. You can go to other spirits and you don't have to give glory to God. You can still get the same result and even take the glory for yourself. So I was saying all this to go back to the idea of one of the things that separate uh, New Age manifestors from biblical manifestation is that they their faith is not in God. Their faith is in the method. And their glory is not given to God. The glory is given to themselves. So when Ryan gets that job, he doesn't say thank you, Jesus. He's going to trust the fact that the method he uses is what got the result. And so if someone comes and asks Ryan, how did you get this job? They'll tell you I did X, Y, and Z. But the Christian, if you ask them, they'll tell you that my faith was in God. You see, because when the, Jesus caused the fig tree to wither, how did he respond to them when they asked, well, how did you do this? He said, have faith in God. That's the answer. I did this because I have faith in God. Now, I can get into the practicality of it. But when it's all said and done, what produced the result is him and my faith in him. And so the first difference between New Age manifesting and biblical manifesting is that the Christian acknowledges the divine will. The second difference is where the faith is. The new age person's faith is in the method. The Christian's faith is in God. And the third difference, which I mentioned before, is the methodology. There are many methods that new age practitioners use that are plainly immoral to manifest things. But of course, the methods we use to manifest, which are really simply three, anyway, speaking, thinking, and acting. But the thing we speak, the thing we act, or the thoughts we think must be in alignment with God's will. We cannot do something immoral in order to manifest uh, a divine possibility. Um, and so those are two fundamental laws that separate biblical manifesting from New Age manifesting. The law of alignment, which is being in alignment with God's will, and the law of faith. Our faith is in God to produce the result. And whatever it is we're seeking to manifest must be God's will for us to have. And we're trusting in him to give us the product. So we want something. We want God to give it to us. And we believe in him to give it to us. The new age person wants something. And they use some kind of spiritual method to get it. To get it. And what actually happens is that since that they're not acknowledging God, another spirit will bring it to them. And they'll think it. And the spirit won't say, hey, I'm the one that did this. Because they don't want glory. They'll allow that man to think that that man is so powerful. Not realizing that they're actually in cohorts with the spirit being, and they'll become a slave to that spirit, thinking that they're so powerful that I'm a powerful, I can manifest whatever life I want. I'm da -da -da. Mm. So, the first difference between New Age manifesting and Christian manifesting is acknowledgement of the divine will. A Christian is not just out to create whatever dream life they want, per se. They're out to obey God's will. And if they want something, they're not just going to pursue it, especially if it's something that is important enough. Um, they're going to consult God's will. That's a huge difference. The new age person just wants something and manifests it. The Christian doesn't just manifest all the desires of their heart, no. Because the moment you then try to manifest something, knowing it's what God doesn't want you to have, what happens immediately is that another spirit will come and replace it. And since you're not now manifesting that possibility by the power of God, another spirit will come and give it to you. But the moment you do that, you're now in obedience with that spirit. So if you want X and God says, I don't want you to have it, but you're, you're stubborn, I want it anyways, another spirit will come and say, okay, I can give it to you. So is manifesting a biblical doctrine? It depends how you define manifesting. According to my definition of manifesting, which is simply to believe or will something into existence by words, thoughts, and actions, manifesting is biblical. God manifests. Jesus manifested on earth. The apostles were taught by Jesus to manifest. Many prophets in the Old Testament manifested. There are scriptures that speak about manifesting. And, 
And the only difference between New Age manifesting and Christian manifesting are a few differentiating principles, like the law of alignment, like the law of faith. New, the New Age person's faith is in the method. The Christian's faith is in God. The New Age person might use immoral methods to manifest. The Christian will always use moral methods to manifest. Um, and the Christian is always going to manifest according to the will of God. The New Age person will manifest according to their own will. So, And there are a, a few more differences, I'm sure, than that. But I just wanted to mention those three. Those are the three differences I wanted to make mention of. Uh, to summarize everything, manifesting is a biblical concept according to the definition I'm using. And we differ from New Age manifested in a few principles. Um, but the idea of manifesting in and of itself is biblical. But we have to be careful how we manifest. You have to manifest according to the scripture, according to God's prescription. We manifest according to God's will. We manifest according to our faith in God. And we manifest uh, uh, by... Um, in, in, in an ethical way, in an ethical way. Um, so yes, I'm going to end here. If you want to receive the life of God, say these words with me. Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sins and reason for my glory. I receive him and I receive his life in Jesus' name. Amen.